Okay, well, Yann, uh, thank you very much. I, the last time I was at this conference was in 2018, so that's four years ago. Um, and uh, as it says uh, on the screen, I am also emeritus professor <laughs> at the university, which used to be called uh, Paris Nord, but is now called uh, Sorbonne Paris Nord. Uh, and here you have pictures of the book that uh, Jan mentioned. That's the new version, 2022. Uh, well, I, I should say also thank you for FFM <laughs> for giving me the opportunity to present my ideas. Um, so here is the outline, uh, the things I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'll try to put post-Keynesian economics wi within a wider framework, then I, I'll go more into specific features of post-Keynesian economics, a brief history of post-Keynesian economics, the main strands of post-Keynesian economics, and then I'll have uh, several slides devoted to uh, the things that uh, seem to have attracted that attention to post-Keynesian economics, either from a theoretical point of view or from a practical point of view, a policy point of view. And then two slides to conclude. So, uh, part one, heterodox schools and Keynesian or post-Keynesian school. Um, well, I'm sure many of you already know uh, there are many names which have been used uh, to describe heterodox economics. In the good old days, we used to say non-orthodox economics, but that was before many of you were born. <laughs> uh, some colleagues at one point myself suggested post-classical paradigm, so there are many names uh, maybe the one that looks better now is new paradigm economics. And then we can call uh, the orthodox side as the old paradigm economics. <laughs> Some people make a distinction between the mainstream neoclassical economics, orthodox economics. I mean, personally, uh, or, or even marginalism, personally, I think uh, while one may make some distinctions, uh, you know, when you look at it from a broad angle, they are all the same. Um, so we're going to focus uh, on ortho uh, heterodox economics, but here are some other names which have also been uh, suggested. Uh, radical political economy by Malcolm Sawyer. Some people claim that all heterodox schools are institutional political economy. How about critical political economy? But then it seems that it's more focused around Marxian economics. Modern political economy has already been taken by people in political science, and usually it means something closer to neoclassical economics, so that's not the right name. And so, yeah, why don't we use heterodox political economy, because many of us think heterodox economics is the right term, and Frederick Lee was one of them, but others think political economy should be the right term. Uh, there's a guy called Stilwell in Australia who believes so, so yeah, the last one would be a combination of both. Um, there are many heterodox schools in economics. Here you have a, a long list of them. Uh, unfortunately, the numbers in each of these schools are not that large. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, then, then there are some uh, which are which one may wonder whether they should be included in the list of uh, heterodox uh, the heterodox school. Uh, for instance, uh, behavioral economics. One should distinguish between the old behavioral economists and the more modern ones. Uh, feminist economics is a mixture. There are many feminist economists who are uh, neoclassical, essentially. 
And uh, yeah, what about agent-based economics? So again, you can do agent-based with heterodox assumptions or orthodox assumptions. Uh, a lot of people also wonder where we should put the neo-Austrians. Are they more neoclassical or more heterodox? Usually they consider themselves, themselves as heterodox economists because they feel rejected by the mainstream. But on the other hand, they have many things in common with neoclassical economics. So it's not always easy to distinguish uh, heterodox uh, schools from uh, orthodox ones, but I guess it depends on how you feel. Um, if we uh, want to, I think it's important this, this figure is important. It helps us understand some of the confusion that sometimes exists. Um, so uh, what, the distinction that I take here, I, I take from a person in the philosophy of uh, science or the history of uh, economics, is to uh, make the distinction on the one hand between heterodox and orthodox, so that's the distinction that you see upwards. So orthodox are the light green and the dark green, if you want. The heterodox are in red. But on the other hand, among the orthodox, you also have dissenters, people who go beyond what you can find in the textbooks. So uh, Keynes, to some extent, could be considered as an orthodox dissenter. I mean, looking at some of the writings that Keynes, you could say that he was an orthodox dissenter. Um, another example, before he became inside the mainstream, would be Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman was considered to be uh, completely out of whack uh, compared to his, uh, say, uh, neoclassical colleagues at the time. But then in the 1960s, early 1970s, well, he became part of the mainstream. But at the time, he was considered as a dissenter. And I think that many of the noble, the people who got the Bank of Sweden uh, prize in honor of Alfred Nobel, uh, all these economists, uh, many of, the, of them, uh, like Stiglitz, for instance, uh, would certainly be considered as dissenters, uh, not the recent ones who got the prize like uh, Bernanke. Uh, and, and so I think it's, it's important to, to make this distinction. There are orthodox people who um, question many of the assumptions that you find in the mainstream, but they don't go so far as one would hope. Uh, what do all these heterodox schools have in common? Uh, well, part of it has to do with the sociology of the profession in the sense that uh, if you are inside the orthodox, then your criticisms of neoclassical theory will be accepted. If you are from the outside, it's not so... Uh, there will be some reluctance uh, from the mainstream to accept your criticisms. And this is most obvious when you read uh, Paul Krugman in his many blogs. Uh, you know, he, he, he looks like he is, well, he certainly he looks like a dissenter. Uh, and uh, I remember reading a book of his uh, about 10 years ago on the Depression and reading it, except for a few paragraphs here and there, the book could have been written by a post keynesian author. But when he is being asked questions about modern monetary theory or when he is being asked, uh, you know, what do you think of the work of Wynne Godley, then he usually <laughs> just puts his thumb down. Some of the differences between the various schools of thought are due to discrepancies in the field of research. So neo schumpeterians are very much interested into technical progress. Post-Keynesian e economists are usually interested more into uh, macroeconomics. 
And this is the point also that Tony Lawson uh, makes. And uh, along with Tony Lawson, I would agree that there are broad features which allow us to, uh, to see the common elements in all those heterodox schools, and I call them, uh, as did uh, Leon Newfood, Axel Leon Newfood, I call them presuppositions, the presuppositions of research. Uh, those are the things that cannot really be questioned. And what are these, uh, according to uh, my opinion? <laughs> but um, so here are, here are the distinctions that I make. I wrote about this back in 1989, uh, so I didn't dream it all by myself. It's by reading through uh, various works by people like, for instance, Luigi Pazinetti or reading the work of uh, philosophers of uh, science, it came to me that, well, there seemed to be some agreement on these five distinctions. Um, so, uh, well, I would argue that the heterodox schools are more concerned with realism. You know, we have to start with realistic hypothesis, whereas on the orthodox side, this is not uh, the point. Um, on the method, and uh, we'll see a, a few examples, uh, we uh, heterodox usually see this in a holistic form, uh, whereas the orthodox schools always start from the individual, so you may, the, the word which is often used is atomicism. On rationality, uh, the neoclassical have some sort of hyper-rationality where the agent is optimizing all the time, whether it's a firm or uh, an individual or household. On the heterodox school, I would not say that we deal with uh, irrationality, uh, but it, it, rather it is a reasonable rationality. Uh, the economic core, well, I would say on heterodox side are the income effects. On the neoclassical side, the focus is substitution effects. And finally, what about the political core? This is something that I added uh, later. I, I think it's fair to say that most of the heterodox schools believe that uh, markets should be regulated and, or should be tamed. Whereas uh, on the other side, there is this optimism about markets, that markets should be left on, on their own, or if there is a problem with the market, then we need a market solution to fix the problem. Whereas this would not be the case on the heterodox side. Uh, I think it shows also when we deal with the ecological transition. Okay, well, what is uh, specific about post-Keynesian economics in all this? So the presupposition of post-Keynesian economics. Well, we, we can certainly say that post-Keynesian economics adopts uh, the five general heterodox presuppositions which I just uh, mentioned, and I'll give on the holism, uh, I'll give a few uh, examples on the next slides. On the idea that uh, we have to tame markets in some way or another, uh, certainly we can say that post Keynesian's underlying disequilibria and instability. Um, so this. Well, I think most of you have heard of Hyman Minsky and his financial instability hypothesis, sometimes called also the financial fragility hypothesis. Uh, but it's the same with the labor market. I think one of the key characteristics of post Keynesians working on labor markets is that they don't believe that we usually are at full employment, however it is defined. And then we have this statement by Keynes uh, who says, well, uh, on one side are those authors, which today we may call orthodox, who uh, believe that 
you know, through some trial and error, the, the market will eventually uh, come to full employment. Whereas uh, Keynes in 1935 was saying, on the other side of the Gulf are those that reject the idea that the existing economic system is in any significant sense self-adjusting. So I, I think it, it's a good uh, statement to reflect the difference between the orthodox view and the heterodox view. Uh, right, well, here is the full, uh, the full statement by Keynes. Uh, Orthodox believe that through creaks and groans and jerks and time lags, eventually the system will self-adjust. I think this <laughs> corresponds well to new Keynesian economics. Okay, some general macroeconomic paradoxes. I'm not going to go through all of them, but of course the, best, the one which is best known is the paradox of thrift. Uh, which is the higher saving rates will lead to reduce output or reduce uh, growth. But there are many of them, many others, uh, in particular the paradox of cost, which is uh, key in those controversies between those who believe that the economy is wage-led or uh, profit-led. Um, there are many flexibility paradoxes, uh, one which we can attribute to uh, Steve Fazzari, who is here. The more flexible nominal wages and prices are, the more dra dramatic the perverse debt effects uh, will be. But there are other uh, flexibility paradoxes which have been uh, underlined recently. And uh, the one that I uh, put in bold is one that I discovered very recently. It's, it's taken from an article written uh, by Giovanni Dozzi, who is a kind of Keynesian neo schumpeterian uh, And I call that the forecasting paradox. And uh, his uh, agent-based uh, work has shown that better forecasting by individual firms may not lead to improved macroeconomic performance of the economy. So you have these individual firms who use the best techniques to do forecasting and who seem to uh, do it well, but the macroeconomic impact, meaning in terms of economic activity and employment, are, will not necessarily be any better than if these firms we're using a very um, simple forecasting methods. So, I, so this is due to the difference between, well, this is uh, due to this holistic uh, fact, the, the, the fact that, you know, the, the whole is not just the sum of the parts and that we have to take that into consideration. This is why macroeconomics is so important. Um, we can also put forward some uh, other macroeconomic paradoxes. So again, one which is very well known is the paradox of tranquility by Minsky. Uh, I don't think he used the term himself, uh, but I defined it in a paper of mine, I think in 1981. And so this is the idea that stability is destabilizing. So you, everything goes well, goes smoothly, but as things go smoothly, people take more risk. And as people take more risk, then uh, we get into an unstable situation. So that's the paradox of tranquility. Again, there are many other uh, paradoxes that we may uh, mention. Uh, I like the paradox of debt, which you can uh, attribute to Irving Fisher back in 1933 or to uh, Joseph Steindl. And that paradox of debt says that efforts to deleverage, so firms try to reduce their debt, might lead in fact to higher debt ratios. Uh, so in fact this is the 
counter, this is the opposite of what Minsky thought, because he thought that as you, as you try to uh, grow faster, go into more debt, this will necessarily lead to a higher debt overall, but it may not be so. So that's a, another paradox. The other paradox which I discovered more recently is the one which is shown in, uh, in bold, the paradox of degrading standards. Uh, I like that paradox very much. It was put forward by uh, Paul Macaulay, who uh, is a Minskian, who uh, has participated in Minsky uh, conferences. And uh, in 2009, he was trying to explain uh, what had happened, uh, how did we get into the, glo well, in the subprime crisis in the United States. And so he argued that, you know, for a long time, default rates were very low in the U.S., but that was because of the degradation of underwriting standards. So the banks were giving loans too easily to anybody, and so nobody was never uh, in a position to default uh, because uh, when they were in, into trouble, they could always sell their house or their apartment to somebody who could get a loan from the bank. So default, default rates were very low, but that was not because the banks were doing a good job in finding the proper credit-worthy uh, borrowers. <laughs> it was the opposite. It was because they were giving loans to just anybody. This is why the default rate was next to zero. But of course, it couldn't go on forever. So, uh, let's come now to those five specific post-Keynesian presuppositions. So here I am following uh, my uh, colleague from Berlin, Eckhart Hein. Uh, you see you have the five presuppositions which are related to uh, heterodox economics in general, and then you have the five which are specific to post-Keynesian economics. So now you have 10. Those are the 10 commandments of uh, Hein. <laughs> So the first one is the principle of effective demand. Uh, it's the idea that effective demand is fundamental, plays a role, but not just in the short run, as many other sorts of Keynesians would believe, like the, our, the old Keynesians of the 1960s or the new Keynesians of today, uh, but it also has an impact, according to post-Keynesians, in the long run as well. And it's related to the idea that it is investment that causes saving and not saving that allows investment. Then we have the idea of the monetary theory of production, so that uh, the role of banks is essential and, uh, you know, we are in a monetary economy. I'll just show us a, a small slide uh, in a few seconds. Then there is the idea of a historic, historical and irreversible time or path dependence. Uh, this we can relate uh, to Joan Robinson who has always made this point. Uh, that, uh, and also to Kaletsky who says that uh, the long run is just a sequence of short runs. And, uh, and so I think th this is important in post-Keynesian economics, although uh, in the past we have not always been able to formalize that uh, very well, um, but uh, at least we are aware of the difference between, say, historical time and uh, logical time. Fundamental uncertainty, uh, well, for some people you could relate this to uh, reasonable rationality in the sense that we don't know everything, we are not omniscient, we are not omnipotent, um, and you just cannot assume that uh, the individual can optimize all the time. 
And then finally, uh, distributional issues uh, are important. Important. I mentioned previously, uh, you know, whether our economies are wage-led or profit-led uh, within the wage bill. Uh, how is wa how are wages being distributed? Is this distribution fair or is it very unequal? And the fact that distributional conflict uh, may uh, lead to inflation. So uh, it's not only, of course, the post-Keynesians who worry about distributional issues. Uh, certainly, the Marxists, the Marxians, uh, also do. Okay, on the monetary theory of production and the importance of banking, here I have a figure which was provided by the Bank of Sweden. Some of you may have seen it because there's a big controversy about, you know, why did we give the Nobel Prize to those three persons? And so this is the view of the Nobel Committee uh, so, banks as creators of money, this is the post Keynesian view. Banks as intermediaries, financial intermediaries, this is the view of the, of the Nobel Prize, Nobel uh, Committee. So, in their view, if you uh, look, uh, the way the world functions is that you have people who bring in coins or bring in cash to the bank, and then thanks to this, the bank uh, is able to uh, provide long-term loans to some entrepreneurs who will transform uh, these coins into uh, something, uh, some, well, something useful, some investment. So this is exactly, this to, to us is completely wrong. Uh, the causality goes the other way. The banks create credit, they grant loans, they create money, in fact, out of nothing. Uh, well, out of nothing, you could say, well, maybe they will ask some collateral from the borrower, and also they need to find a borrower willing to borrow, so it's not quite out of nothing. Uh, but uh, it's not at all what is being shown here. Uh, there is also another uh, picture which was offered by uh, Kumhoff, who is uh, an economist who used to be at the IMF, but now is at the Bank of England. And uh, what he was saying, he, well, what he was saying was wrong, was uh, arguing that people bring in gra gravel to the bank the, the bank keeps it in, in stock, and then when they find a borrower, they, bo they lend the, the gravel to the uh, investor who can then produce cement or whatever. I mean, as you can see, the, the, there's a plant there where they produce something. So, uh, this to us is completely uh, the wrong way of seeing how uh, finance works. Okay. History of post-Keynesian uh, economics. Also, this is a brief history. Uh, it goes very fast. One can say that there are five phases, and uh, one may also wonder whether the beginnings are really only in the mid-1950s, but uh, I'm going to go through those uh, five uh, phases with the following uh, slide. But in fact, I start with uh, phase zero, <laughs> which is, uh, well, some, some of my colleagues, like John King, would argue that post-Keynesian economics started in the 1930s. Um, and so the argument would be that, well, we had Keynes' banana parable uh, already in 1929, when he was presenting at the Macmillan Committee on Banking. Uh, it's a really funny parable. I encourage you to have a look at it, or you can ask me during the question period what the banana parable was. <laughs> uh, then, you know, we call ourselves post Keynesian, so, for, of course, the general theory of 1936 is very important. 
And then in the 1930s, there were many articles that we, we, we still find highly useful. Uh, Kaleski had uh, many on the cycle, the principle of increasing risk. Already he was talking about the positive role of real wages for aggregate demand, and he had a theory of profits which we still use uh, today. And Caldor had a you know, really interesting paper in 1934 where you, where you can link this to one of these key presuppositions of post-Keynesian economics, which I mentioned, which is uh, the importance of time and, and path dependence. And there, in that paper, already in 1934, he had these concepts, multiple equilibria and path dependence. And then related to uh, uh, fiscal policy, you had this uh, paper and then a book by Abba Lerner on functional finance, which I think uh, plays an important role today. But uh, most of the people, like myself, would uh, say that, well, post-Indian economics, recognizing that there was something different, starts only in the mid-50s and perhaps even in the 1960s. And uh, a key book is the book by Joan Robinson called The Accumulation of Capital. Uh, she used that title in honor of uh, Rosa Luxembourg. And simultaneously, there was also an article on income distribution by Caldor in 1956, where he uh, presents uh, in a formalized way what the post-Kinsian income distribution theory of the time uh, was. Um, so uh, those two theories on income distribution were called at the time Neo-Keynesian. I mean, this was the name that was being used. Uh, sometimes it was called the Cambridge theory of income distribution, and sometimes it was called the Italo-Cambridge theory of income distribution, uh, because many Italians were then studying at Cambridge with you know, people like John Robinson, Piero Sraffa, uh, and uh, Caldor, and uh, yeah, Pazinetti uh, wrote uh, a famous extension of the uh, article of Caldor. Um, right, uh, Mata, uh, who is uh, more into the philosophy of science, uh, argued, and I think he's right, that uh, it was, you know, when those theories of income distribution, the theory essentially was saying that if the rate of growth is higher, the rate of profit will be higher. Uh, so this was in contradiction to uh, marginal productivity. And uh, so it's at that time that people in Cambridge first realized that what they were doing, so the Keynesians that were in Cambridge realized that their Keynesian view was different from the Keynesians that existed in the US. And then this theory, this theory of distribution gave rise to hundreds of papers based on Robinson, Caldor, Pazinetti, now it's not as popular as it was. The more popular one now is the neo uh, theory of growth and distribution. Um, then we had the capital controversies. So again, this uh, gave the opportunity to uh, the people at Cambridge or people who were friendly to the Cambridge view uh, to realize that what they were saying was different, again, from the neoclassical Keynesians like uh, Solo, Samuelson, even Tobin, uh, that what these people were saying in the U.S. So there was a big controversy. Uh, the idea, in particular, that the rate of return on capital cannot be a measure of the scarcity of capital. Um, it was a, a complex uh, controversy. Uh, then there was also some work. Uh, w the first one that came up with the idea was Anwar Sheikh in 1975, where he showed that the apparent success 
of the neoclassical production function, cup douglas production function, CES, constant elasticity of substitution production function, that these apparently were successful, but simply because they were replicating national account identities. So, you know, you have lots of people who say, well, why should we worry about the Cambridge capital controversies? When we do regressions on the neoclassical production function, it works very well. And the answer, it, the reason for which it works very well, those econometric regressions on production functions work very well, is because they estimate, in fact, the profit and wage shares in national income instead of estimating the elasticities of the factors of production. And there's this book by uh, Jesus Felipe and John McCombie that was published in 2013, which puts together all the articles that they have written on this topic, and which explains very well why uh, any econometric work on production function at the industry level or at the macroeconomic level are completely uh, worthless, unfortunately. Uh, I, I explained this to my colleagues at the University of Ottawa, of Ottawa once in a workshop, and uh, the answer of a couple of them who had done some work for developing economies was, well, you know, so what? Uh, I, I have to have numbers and I'll just keep, it, keep doing it, even if I now realize that it's all wrong. Okay, uh, in the 1970s also, as I said, Milton Friedman came to the limelight. In particular, he had this paper in 1968 where he was apparently providing a new explanation why we could have stagflation, simultaneously inflation and a recession. And uh, so Friedman became highly popular and he are, was arguing that, well, if... Inflation can only be a monetary phenomenon. If you increase the rate of growth of the money supply, then it will lead to an increase in the rate of growth of prices. And the response to this uh, came from people at Cambridge in particular, uh, where they argued, no, the causality goes the other way. It's because there is an increase in economic activity that there is an increase in the money supply. And so you, all these uh, people, Cal Dorr, Richard Kahn, Joan Robinson, Tony Cramp, who is less known, all these people from Cambridge uh, published papers and later even books on explaining this point of view. And in France, the same point of view was being put by Jacques Le Bourva uh, already in 1959 and 1962 in very, very clear terms. And I have translated parts of these two papers in the Review of Political Economy in 1992. Uh, the funny thing is that Le Bourva was saying, uh, well, he, he was saying, uh, the quantity theory of money, or if you want, the old version of monetarism, is dead. He, he wrote this in 1959, and, and just 10 years later, uh, the quantity theory of money was back into uh, all the central banks. Okay, so as I said, the causality between money and inflation is reverse. The causality between bank reser reserves and bank deposits is, reserves, is reversed. Uh, meaning that uh, the central bank has no choice but to provide the reserves and the banknotes that uh, banks and people are looking for. Uh, and this is why, this is, yeah, the, this is due to the fact that the central bank, essentially what it can control is the, is the short-term rate of interest. It cannot really control uh, the amount of money in the system. So central bank open market operations are not uh, there in order to decrease or increase the stock of money. Their purpose is to control interest rate or stabilize interest rates. And what, so the work of central banks is essentially defensive. And this has been underlined by 
you know, many Postkinsians, including Alfred uh, Eichner, who is usually known more for his work on the Megacorp. Okay, the Americans joined in. Uh, Sidney Weintraub started criticizing neoclassical synthesis uh, already in 58. Uh, Basil Moore, who wrote a book on endogenous money, and Paul Davidson went to Cambridge in the late 1960s. Davidson wrote a book called Money and the Real World, which in my opinion is his best book. And uh, finally, in December 1971, there was a meeting at the American Economic Association. There was a dinner with about 15 people. And you can read the names there. Many of them uh, you, you must know. And Joan Robinson was there. And Joan Robinson and Alfred Eichner agreed on the denomination of this school of thought that was arising. And they called it, that's the exact uh, writing, post-Kinsian with a dash, as is written there. There's no capital P, uh, and the dash is there. Please use this. <laughs> this is the biggest controversy that we have in post-Kinsian economics, whether there should be a dash or not. <laughs> Whoops, shoot. <laughs> Uh, and uh, famous, I mean, the paper that perhaps influenced me the most, uh, I was then a fourth year undergraduate student at the University of Ottawa, uh, no, I was at Carleton University, which is the other university in Ottawa. Uh, they published a paper in the Journal of Economic Literature in December 1975, and at the time I was taking a workshop by, uh, well, not a workshop, it was a seminar by a, a professor who was teaching us all kinds of different schools of thought, and he spent some time on the Cambridge controversies and some time on this uh, neo well, neo-Keynesian model of growth of Caldor and Robinson. And so I read that article uh, at, at the time, and uh, they claimed, Eichner and Jan Kregel, they claimed that a new paradigm had been born, and they called it post-Kinsian economics. And the, summar the summary they give of this new school is exactly the one that we would give it today. So this paper was written almost 50 years ago, but I think it's still worth going back and uh, reading it. So I'll skip uh, a bit. Then there was a, a third uh, period, uh, mainly uh, 1980s, 1990s, where uh, Giuseppe Fontana calls it the Romantic Age, because the, there were many textbooks that came out that were trying to put together what do we mean by this new uh, paradigm post-Kinsian economics, which is different from neoclassical economics and different from Marxist economics. And so here you have a list of uh, those uh, books, uh, textbooks to some extent, that were uh, written at the time. Um, and, and so, yeah, Davidson himself in 1972. Jan Kregel had a, a good book also, 73. Hyman Minsky, again, I would say his best book is the one in 1975. It just looks like the best book of someone is always the first one, not the, <laughs> not the later ones. Um, anyway, so here you have a, a list of all these important books. And, uh, and at the same time, there was an institutionalization of post Keynesian economics. Uh, the Cambridge Journal of Economics was created. The Journal of post keynesian e Economics almost uh, at the same time. And other journals, the Thames Papers, which uh, the Thames, uh, uh, the Thames, it was not a university, it was um, some sort of a college then. then. Now it's Greenwich University. And so all those Thames Papers can be found on the website uh, there. Uh, review of Political Economy, uh, Metro Economica. Then we had summer schools. Uh, 
the Trieste Summer School, which started, started around 1981, which was said to be a disaster because the Srafians and the other post keynesians just could not agree with each other. The post keynesians American post keynesians focusing on uncertainty, and that made the Srafians go berserk. <laughs> uh, but I went to that summer school in, uh, in 1984. I had great, uh, good, uh, good souvenirs. And then there were many others. Uh, Yen mentioned uh, the Berlin Summer School, uh, the Levy Institute Summer School. There's now in England, you have the post keynesian Economics uh, Society so Summer School in, in, uh, in England. Um, there, there's been blogs, uh, newsletters, conferences, uh, new journals came out, uh, intervention that was mentioned, the review of Keynesian economics, you have the Brazilian Keynesian review, uh, and, and many other uh, journals. So now there's really a wide variety of journals in which heterodox economists can publish if they cannot manage to publish in uh, the f more fancy uh, mainstream journals. Uh, and, uh, and then you have this FMM conferences, uh, which are uh, clearly uh, a great uh, success. And, uh, and a few post keynesian associations have been created. Okay, then uh, the fourth stage is what, again, Giuseppe Fontana calls the age of uncertainty. So that's in the 1990s, early 2000, perhaps. And uh, then when, if you went to conferences, you would see a lot of papers on methodology, a lot of papers uh, trying to you know, uh, define what is uncertainty, what do we mean by it. A lot of papers devoted to the history of economic thought. To some extent, this was uh, generated by the appearance, the publication of the collected writings of Keynes. You know, there were 30 volumes. So Keynes is not always easy to read. And so you, you can have many interpretations of what he is saying. Um, anyway, so at that time, I mean, I've got nothing against uh, doing work in philosophy of science or methodology or history of economic thought, but I think it's fair to say that for a while there was a little bit too much of it. And then this was followed by the current stage, which I would call the age of policy. So for the last uh, 20 years, I would say, if you go to conferences such as this one, you will see uh, a lot of papers devoted to policy issues. So trying to figure out what should be done. A large proportion of papers also using empirical analysis, not necessarily econometrics, uh, but yes, uh, quite often also econometrics. And there's a return to formalization. So you have those Kaliskin growth models, the neo Goodwinian uh, models, cyclical models or growth models. You have stock flow consistent models to which I have contributed uh, with the book with Wynn Godley. And often this is now associated with agent-based models. So people combine uh, the two. And finally, uh, ecological macroeconomics has a lot of uh, formalization. So what is our point of view about formalization and econometrics in post-Keynesian economics? Well, this is a point of contention within post-Keynesians, but also between post-Keynesians and some of the other heterodox schools of thought. For instance, you know, I've been in France during three years, between 2016 and 2019, and, uh, you know, I could see that some of the we, we attend the, some of the same conferences as the institu French institutionalists, but they are sort of worried about, well, aren't those post in some kind of Trojan horse getting into the heterodox schools and they're going to introduce all these econometrics and formalizations? So there is this, uh, this tension, I would say. 
But even somebody like uh, Rick Holt, who uh, doesn't do any formalization, uh, agrees that while post Keynesians should be skeptical about prediction, this does not mean that they should abandon all empirical work. So, you know, it, even, even those on the side of, uh, say, less formalization agree that, well, we have to do empirical work or uh, formalization as well. Bill Mitchell, who is one of the leaders of the modern monetary theory school, uh, says that policymakers require hard numbers for policy making. Uh, and, and so, yeah, uh, we can do some basic forecasting or uh, we can use econometrics. And I think the best argument is the one provided by Deirdre McCloskey, who said that econometrics is a powerful weapon in the battle of ideas. Economics is all about rhetoric. So even if you don't believe in econometrics, it's good to be able to do it uh, because our neoclassical colleagues use that in order to convince politicians. You know, the, I mean, the politician will not look at the econometric model, but the politician will be looking at the results of the econometric model. And so you have to be able to say, well, I have my own econometric model and I'm getting completely different results. Okay, so, uh, you know, the, 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 the end line, the, the last, uh, the overall picture is that, uh, yeah, post-Keynesians endorse the cautious use of formal methods in economics. I think it's a fair statement to make. Now, there are some people who disagree. Tony Lawson, uh, well, he, 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 he now is very, it, it used to be, okay, okay, Tony Lawson has always been against formalization under many circumstances, uh, but it was not very clear what he thought about formalization in heterodox economics until recently. But now, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, what he's saying now is that um, heterodox contributions have become increasingly weak and of little relevance to the world because they are doing too much formalization. So now he's quite clear uh, that uh, he, he is opposed to any kind of formalization. And uh, a fan of his uh, called Slade Caffarel published a paper in the Cambridge Journal of Economics in 2019 giving support to Lawson and uh, saying that uh, the work of post Keynesians is worthless all the same because the method, formalizing, is irrelevant. So for Slade Caffarel, uh, people who do formalization in post keynesian economics are confused, inconsistent, heterodox economists. So uh, we have to revise the way to see uh, these uh, dissenters. So we have main orthodox dissenters. We also have heterodox dissenters. But we have on the one side, on the most on the left, consistent heterodox economists, so those are not doing any formalization. And then you have the inconsistent heterodox economists, and I would say several post Keynesian economists, including myself. So this is just to tell you, yes, there is some tension out there. The various strands of post-Keynesian economists, so I'm going to go a bit faster because I see that I have about 15 minutes left at most. Okay, so the most famous typology uh, the, it was the one by Hamouda, Omar Hamouda, who is a Canadian, and uh, Jeffrey Harcourt, who passed away uh, not very long ago. So they identified three strands, the fundamentalist post-Keynesians, mainly so-called American post-Keynesians, the Kaleskians, and then the Srafians. 
And then at the end of their paper, they say, well, we don't know where to put Robinson, Caldor, Goodwin, Godley, Pezzinetti. So I always thought, well, you know, they're <laughs> There's something missing out there. And so I have proposed a, a five-way current uh, typology. So we still have the fundamentalist Keynesians, the Kaleskians, the Srafians. So they, in a way, each specialize into different topics. And then we have two additional ones, the institutionalist post-Keynesians and the Caldorian post-Keynesians. So uh, if you are interested in modern monetary theory, I would put them into the institutionalist post-Keynesians, along with uh, the father and the son, uh, Galbraith. Um, so I have put names out there. Um, I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know how Steve feels about being put in the Kaliskians. But anyway, uh, today I would argue that eclectic authors go across all or at least two of these categories. Um, so a good example of somebody who is, was very eclectic is Edward Nell. Uh, but many young post-Kinsians, I believe, take things from these different strands. So it's just a way to perhaps better understand, uh, to, to read the literature, uh, it helps you to, to not get lost in the details. Okay, post-Keynes in economics in the limelight today, I'll have to go a bit faster. Uh, so there's a number of uh, topics we, which I'm going to touch, but I'm, I'm going to go a bit uh, quick. Okay, I think we can say that post-Keynes had an impact on monetary theory as uh, a number of central bankers now make references to post-Keynesian works in monetary theory. Um, and uh, there are many, well, the, the, the most famous one is perhaps the, the paper by Meckley and his co-authors at the Bank of England where they describe how money is being created and it's as if it had been written by a post-Keynesian. At the Bundesbank also, they had a paper uh, making the same exercise. Uh, people at the central banks of Poland and Hungary, uh, I, I've been told that, well, we always thought that money was endogenous and that what we were doing was controlling the rate of interest and that banks can create money out of nothing. But we never dared to say it before until the Bank of England said so in 2014. Then they let themselves loose and go forward. And uh, yeah, people at the Bank of International Settlements also uh, have been influenced, I think. Uh, the financial instability hypothesis certainly came to the limelight because of the, um, the crisis, the financial crisis of 2008. And uh, so, this, so both from a policy uh, perspective and also from a theoretical perspective, uh, it has attracted the attention of mathematicians who are now into post-Keynesian economics. Uh, it has uh, attracted, uh, well, and also you have the, these notions of critical finance, Daniela Gabor, uh, Sissoko, I forgot her first name, Perry Merling, these people are quite, they're, they're not necessarily exactly post-Keynesians, but they're very close to that and do, do have influence uh, among people, say, in uh, international political economy. Uh, modern monetary theory uh, certainly has had quite an impact. Uh, Joël Leclerc is here and will make a talk on it uh, with uh, a comment by uh, Joe Mitchell. Uh, I, as I said before, MMT is without a doubt part of the post keynesian tradition. Uh, the implicit macroeconomic theory of MMT relies on post keynesian macroeconomic uh, theory. Th their view of uh, the money creation is exactly the same as uh, that of post-Keynesians. The central bank is also essentially pursuing defensive 
uh, operations, and both MMT and post Keynesians believe that fiscal policy should be the main tool to stabilize the uh, economy. So, uh, yes, uh, so, and, and also a lot of students have told me a lot, well, a few of them have told me that they came to post Keynesian economics after having read blogs on MMT and then tried to go a bit further and discovered post Keynesian economics. Um, so there's a few statements by MMT that attract attention. Uh, the, for instance, the limit to government spending is not a financial one. Uh, the job guarantee program can act as an inflation anchor, so we could have both full employment and uh, inflation stabilization together. So, so those statements attract attention, but at the same time are uh, controversial. And uh, they are so controversial that, uh, as you may have known, some U.S. senators have condemned MMT, saying that it is the duty of the Senate to condemn modern monetary theory <laughs> and recognize that the implementation of modern monetary theory would lead to higher deficits and higher inflation. So now in some of the blogs in the newspapers, you can read that the reason why there is inflation in the U.S. is because of MMT. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so clearly they have had a great impact uh, on whatever is being uh, talked about in the newspapers and by uh, the pundits in, in finance. Uh, there's been a revival also of a monetary circuit theory that was put forward by Augusto Graziani and, uh, in Italy and Alain Parguez uh, in France. Uh, uh, and this is linked to MMT. Uh, there's a similarity between, you know, for monetary circuit theory, banks provide uh, loans to firms so they can uh, produce and the same uh, with MMT. They say, well, the government spends first, and then uh, they can recover. Uh, it can recover the funds. Also linked to MMT, but this time as a critique, is the currency hierarchy hypothesis. Uh, so this is the work of Bonizzi, Fritz, Kelton Brunner, who will talk this afternoon. To, uh, Bernengo. Uh, Herr Daniela Prates, who will talk tonight. Um, so this is a, I, I find it's a very interesting uh, hypothesis, the currency hierarchy hypothesis, you know, arguing that, well, uh, for countries whose currency is not at the top, uh, controlling interest rates and having a fiscal and monetary policy is much more difficult than it is for a country like Canada or Japan. Okay, Kaliskin growth and distribution. Well, uh, this is uh, the model that has become highly popular. And again, the reason is because different schools of thought can use it. And uh, this question about wage-led and profit-led, well, has been uh, discussed and research at the International Labor Office at UNCTAD. So, uh, and, and there's been many, many different uh, new, I mean, uh, new works on this. Uh, I can mention uh, people working on the macroeconomic impact of organized crime have used the neo kalaskin model. Uh, work on degrowth, the work on the gender wage gap has been uh, done as well. So it's a model which is very flexible and which has been used quite a lot. And there is a link also with the so-called Srafin super multiplier, which has become highly popular uh, over the years. And I know I've seen some of the representatives of this uh, view uh, here uh, this morning. I remember the first time I presented uh, the Kaleskian version of this Strafian super multiplier to students at the summer school in Berlin. That was in 
2013 or 2014, I made a presentation and there was zero question, zero, zero, zero. Nobody understood what I was doing. And then the next year, it was uh, the fashion and the fad to work on this topic. So don't worry about fads, just do your thing. Uh, yeah, we, we used to do a lot of work on income distribution, functional income distribution. Now there's a lot of work on personal income distribution, a lot of work on wealth distribution as well, generated to some extent by the work of Piketty has encouraged us to go in that direction as well. I'm running a bit out of time. This is why I'm speeding up. Uh, as I said before, uh, it, well, before 2000, there was, uh, and still is, a tension between ecological economics and post-Keynesian economics. Because post-Keynesians, you, you know, the thing we were obsessed about was how can we reach full employment? And so the answer was, well, if we can grow faster, we have a better probability of getting to full employment. On the other hand, we were facing ecological uh, economists who were saying, well, we need a stationary economy with no growth, and even perhaps degrowth. So uh, it was rather difficult to, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to, meet, uh, to meet together on these issues. Uh, but more recently, uh, post-Keynesians have tried to go into this field of macroeconomic, ecological economics, and from a reciprocal point of view, on the other hand, Ecological economists have discovered post-Keynesian economics. They have discovered stock flow consistent analysis. And so many of the ecological macroeconomics is now based, I would say most of it is now based on post-Keynesian economics in one way or another. And an example of this is the work by two well-known uh, and long-time ecological economist, uh, Jackson and Peter Victor. Okay. Um, yeah, lots of work on the balance of payments constraint. Turlwall's law is the model that has attracted the attention of a lot of people in South America. I'm going to skip this. And then we come to inflation theory. Well, we haven't done much work on inflation theory over the last few years because, like everybody, we thought, ah, we have 2% rate of inflation everywhere in Europe, in uh, North America. It's low in many other countries. In uh, Japan, they have 0%. They're trying to push it up. And now, of course, uh, we have a different situation. And so, uh, yeah, f inflation theory is again in the, uh, in the fashion. And uh, I do believe that, yeah, we have a lot to contribute to uh, the explanation of uh, inflation. I've already mentioned that agent-based models are often, uh, are often using this stock flow consistent uh, methodology. Uh, and so, yeah, there, there are SFC models at the Bank of England, at the Italian Department of Finance, at the Agence Française de Développement. So there are institutions who are uh, using this. And by the way, I have a PhD, well, he's now a doctor, but a former PhD uh, student of mine who finished last year, who, told, who has produced a program in R in order to be uh, to generate SFC models, and he told me that more than 300 people have used his uh, software. So I was rather uh, stunned. Okay, comparative political economy is also... Now you have people in uh, comparative political economy who get interested into the post-Keynesian view that the economy is led by demand and not necessarily by su supply, and so you have uh, all these discussions, uh, many of us, Stockhammer, Hein, uh, Jan Beringer, uh, Till Ventrick, who are uh, now uh, 
communicating with people in international political economy. Okay, one topic which has been left out is microeconomics. Uh, there's been less work on it. I think it, it is important, so I would hope that more would be done. Uh, but there is this book which uh, is really interesting by Shio Sawa and his colleagues, published three years ago. It's called Micro Foundations of Evolutionary Economics, but it just could as well could be uh, Micro Foundations of Post Keynesian Economics. Um, it's really, uh, really interesting. Um, so the, the with an, uh, by analytics, uh, they demonstrate that price adjustments are not needed in a model with several sectors, each sector having several firms, uh, and the whole adjustment is done through inventories and unutilized capacity. Okay, final thoughts, so the last two slides. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I think it's a universal phenomenon, it seems that the most extremist versions always attract all the attention. Uh, Paul Davidson uh, had very, uh, I would say, an extremist version on, on what economics should be or what Keynesian economics should be. On the Srafian side, you had Piero Piangelo Garignani who had more extreme views on methodology in the role of uh, mathematical formalization. There's a lot of works uh, commenting on Tony Lawson. And uh, one could argue also that the general version of MMT with the consolidation hypothesis is also some extreme view and seems to be generating a lot of attention. But I think it's the same in, uh, you know, in policy. I mean, when people pay a lot of at attention to the extremes left or the extremes right. Okay, the conclusion is what, what about the future of PK economics? Should post Keynesian economics engage more with social sciences? Well, if you have the time to do so, good. And in fact, this is what is happening with international political economy. Should we engage more with other heterodox schools? Well, certainly, uh, especially if you focus on one field, then certainly you have the time to look at what the other heterodox schools are saying on this field. But if you look at many different fields simultaneously, then it becomes more difficult. And uh, what is our relationship with orthodox economists? Uh, should we cooperate, fight, ignore them? Should we tweak existing neoclassical models like the new consensus model? So there are, uh, I mentioned here, a few uh, interesting papers who deal with these questions and try to provide uh, answer, the last one being Duncan Foley in the book that you see here. Thank you very much, and now I await your questions. Apparently, there's a microphone that should be circulating. Ah, yeah. Hi, um, Martin Sokol, Trinity College Dublin. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation, amazing. I just would like you to go back to your statement that the hyphen is so important for post-Keynesian uh, economics, so I wonder if you could say a little bit more about it, and also whether post-Keynesian should be capitalized or, or, or not. Is there are there any views on this? Thank you very I, much. I, I didn't understand your, your first question. It go the back. hyphen. The hyphen between post-Keynesian. Ah, so you yes. emphasize that it's the biggest controversy in, uh, in the field. So I would like you to elaborate on that and explain why this is, this is such an important issue. Well, if I can Thank give you, you an, a short... I don't, I don't want to give a long answer. Just a short answer. The, the post-Kinsen with the dash is the way that Eichner and Robinson wrote it. So since they were uh, you know, at the heart of the creation of the field, I think this is how it should be written. Uh, the post-Kinsen without the dash 
This was uh, a writing that Paul Davidson adopted when he created the Journal of post keynesian Economics in 1978. And the reason he did this is that he thought that uh, people like John Robinson and Eichner were too much Kaleskian, too much left-wing, so he wanted post keynesian without a dash to incorporate uh, you know, people that were not so much, that people that could be considered as orthodox dissenters. Uh, I don't know, like say Hicks or Tobin. Um, yeah, so, that, so that, that's how it's, that's why we got two spelling from the start. And, uh, and the situation was never really resolved. Uh, so, but I, I think in England they tend to use the dash more. Like the post keynesian Economic Society has a dash. <laughs> yeah. Ibrahim <laughs> uh, Shikaki, uh, the other Trinity in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, um, I was just wondering if you can maybe shed some light on the contribution of post-Keynesian economics in, in the global south um, and on the issue of development. I, I mean, I know there has been contributions, but I think it would be fair to say that, you know, perhaps not as much as focusing on advanced um, economies. And I'm just wondering why you think that's the case and what can happen in that field. Yeah, well, that, that certainly is a good question. And I was giving a class in Paris uh, three day, well, five days ago, and I got the same question from someone uh, from Africa. So I guess, uh, well, I, again, I think it's a matter of um, specialization. So there are people who are very close to post keynesian economics, like Lance Taylor, who have done a lot of work, uh, who, who would call himself a structuralist or neo-structuralist uh, because of his uh, closeliness with uh, the work of the Latin American structuralist economist. Um, uh, and then there, there are people, uh, well, uh, Storm and Nastepad started getting into uh, Calician economics by uh, studying the Indian economy. Um, and there are lots, lots of Srafians, or there used to be lots of Srafians in, uh, in India. Uh, Amitav Adot, when he first wrote his paper in 1984, his paper was the beginning of neo calescian economics. Well, again, his basis, what he had in mind was the Indian economy. I mean, and, and that's the funny thing. The funny thing is that, I mean, a crucial feature of neo calescian economics is the belief that most of the time, we are not at full capacity, that most of the time there is excess capacity, it is possible to produce more. The rate of utilization is flexible. And, uh, you know, you, very often people tell me, well, this may be true in uh, Europe or the United States, but it's not, not really true in developing economies. But the funny thing is that that and, and Lance Taylor, when they wrote their first papers on this, they give as an example developing economies. For them, uh, the, in fact, Taylor says in his uh, book of 1983, I don't know if this flexible rate of utilization applies to the USA, but I know it does apply to developing economies. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that roughly that would be my uh, my answer. So yes, there are people who, uh, except maybe they don't necessarily carry the name post Keynesian, you know, but they are they would be closer to the structuralist uh, Latin American structuralist, for instance. And there's a guy called uh, Velupilai um, Fitzgerald. He has written a whole book on. Neo Calescian economics applied to developing economies. So Fitzgerald is the name, but his first name is Indian. 
uh, and I saw his book on uh, Amazon, but it's uh, $170 <laughs> US. <laughs> it's hard to find. A <laughs> Hello, uh, Doris Neuberger from University of Rostock. Well, thanks a lot for this uh, very nice um, presentation. I agree with you in all points except one uh, regarding Diamond and Dubwick, uh, the Nobel Prize winners, because I think there are some misunderstandings. Um, well, uh, some people now, also Puskensians and others, um, they criticize that um, Diamond and Dubwick um, are in contradiction to endogenous money creation. But there's no contradiction. Um, in contrast, uh, they explain that uh, the lending by banks creates deposits with certain features that would not be uh, existence uh, in a perfect capital markets. So their aim is to explain um, the function of banks to create uh, safe deposits uh, from their risk taking. So you should really be cautious uh, to interpret their theories as um, exogenous money. This is just not the case. Um, well, this is also some mis misunderstandings maybe because Diamond's model is called delegated monitoring. But this does not imply that the savers are there first and they delegate banks to, uh, to lend. But if you look at their models, they start from lending and they explain that we need banks uh, because otherwise in, in, the, in the model of perfect capital markets we would not have uh, deposits with uh, features we like, like uh, liquidity and uh, uh, low risk. Okay, this is just my point. Well, listen, I'll be frank, I've never read his uh, model. Uh, so, I, I'm only relying on what is to be found on the site of the Bank of Sweden. And uh, it's clear from the site of the Bank of Sweden that banks are just financial intermediaries. They are just making, you know, they, they're just intermediate between the, the borrowers and the lenders. They do not create as such. I mean, this is the definition of financial intermediary, you say no. But uh, there, there's been many papers which you can find on the site of INET and uh, on the blog of Louis-Philippe Rochon, I forgot the name, where you'll see uh, other criticisms of uh, Diamond and also of Bernanke. But as I said, I haven't read Diamond, so. I'll grant you whatever you said. <laughs> Hello, I'm Clara Thier from the University of Duisburg-Essen. Uh, thank you for the interesting uh, presentation. I would just like to know, now I'm curious, what is the banana parable? <laughs> okay. <by Keynes? laughs> Yeah, the banana parable is a story that Keynes told at the Macmillan Committee in 1929. It is, you can find it in the Treatise on Money of 1930. And so uh, Keynes says, well, imagine that all that we are producing are bananas. And then there is a austerity campaign, you know, saying, oh, things are not going too well, so we should save more. By saving, you know, the idea being if we save more, we will manage to invest more, you know. So people stop spending, stop buying bananas, and so what happens? Well, they will all rot. They all become rotten, and what happens to, uh, what happens to, to the firms? Well, they all make losses, and so how are these losses compensated? Well, they are compensated because, through the savings of the households who decided not to buy the bananas anymore. So all these savers are bringing their cash to the banks, and it, it is this cash which is now being lent 
to the banks, uh, to, not to the banks, which is being lent to the banana producers to cover their financial losses. So it's a, it's a kind of ad absurdo uh, demonstration of that, you know, if we try to save more, thinking that this will provide firms with more investment, that the impact will be the opposite. The firms will not invest more. The, the money which is being saved will just cover the losses of the firms. But it's more obvious because the banana are rotten. You know, you cannot keep them in inventory, in stock. Ooh, this looks like my Srafin super multiplier. <laughs> yes, hello, good morning. Uh, Julian Ferrin from Freie Universität Berlin. Um, merci beaucoup for your presentation. I was wondering, regarding the um, um, policy room um, um, literature covering the, the, the developing countries, uh, which you mentioned, Fritz, uh, Prates, etc. Um, to what extent do you have any knowledge regarding the influence that uh, this uh, work from this trend of literature is currently having in policy influencing organizations such as those based in, in DC in the United States and, and in other places of the world? To what extent is this work resonating? I, I'm sorry, which uh, part of the... Which uh, theory is your... Uh, well, for example, currency hierarchy, uh, all, all that respect, uh, Daniela yeah. Pratt, this, um, all, all, all those. Uh, okay, well, this is a good question, but you will have to ask it to Daniela Prates, who... I intend to, of course. <laughs> she will be here this afternoon. Uh, yes, of course, I want to have your, your take on that, uh, to which, which well, extent you, you know... Well, to tell you frankly, I don't know. <laughs> you know. That's okay. uh, well, the only thing I can say about this, is, the only thing I know is that, uh, well, the... Uh, I, I think one can say that the hierarchy of currency of currencies is some, in some way related to uh, capital controls. So, you know, when there was the crisis in Iceland, 2007, 2008, uh, with, with the bank crisis and all that, uh, it is the IMF which suggested to Iceland to impose capital controls, surprisingly. So, I mean, th this is the, the only link I know about that I can talk about because I was there in Iceland at, at the time. Yeah. Hello, uh, I'm Manya from UMass. Uh, I was wondering if you could say a little more about, uh, you mentioned Philip and Macombi, the difference between factor shares and elasticities. Um, but I was wondering, I mean, do you, Rather, do you take a stand against all production functions, or do you think, uh, or do you take a stand in favor of, say, the Leontief production function, or do you think this is ultimately an empirical question? Um, and also, like, there's just been like a lot of work, um, you know, building on Robert Hall, which takes very seriously um, the estimation of elasticities, I mean, say, literature on productivity growth in the presence of monopsony and bargaining, um, which estimates elasticities, um, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, and how they are different from factor shares. Um, so, so, I mean, I, I would like to understand okay. more about this critique. And yeah, I, I, I understood uh, at least broadly the, the question you're, you're putting. So the issue is, uh, what about those capital controversies in uh, the second stage where the focus, okay, we, let, let me put it this way. During the capital controversies, uh, there were several answers being provided by uh, neoclassical economists, and one of them was, uh, okay, uh, you, maybe you're right from a logical point of view, but from an empirical point of view, when we do these regressions on neoclassical production functions, they function pretty well. I mean, if we take 
technical progress in a correct, uh, if we take into account technical progress in a correct way, then we always get very high uh, rates of uh, R, R squares. And uh, what Anwar Sheikh and then Macombi and uh, Felipe have, have shown is that, you know, what they do is that by construction, they construct an economy which is not neoclassical, which, for instance, has fixed coefficients. And, uh, and, so, and then they run a regression on it. And what, and what they discover is that the, what would be the elasticities if you were neo, you know, computing them from a neoclassical point of view, in fact, just turn out to be uh, the wage share or the profit shares. And so, uh, again, it's an ab absurdo demonstration. Uh, so if you want, by construction, you, you, you construct an economy which is not neoclassical, which does not fulfill any of the conditions of a neoclassical production function. And then despite that, you find the elasticities uh, yeah, elasticities which uh, would seem to uh, correspond to what you would expect in a neoclassical model, but in fact, no. What you have found are the weight share and profit shares that were assumed from the start in the construction of your little uh, artificial economy. Hello. Um, thank you so much for such a great overview. I'm over here. Um, my name is Jenny Stevens. I'm a professor of sustainability science and policy um, at Northeastern University School of Public Policy. So I was very interested in your, I'm new to this area, and I was very interested in your characterization of the last 20 years as more policy relevant. Um, and um, I, I guess in response to this, your last slide, thinking about the future of of post-Keynesian economics. I'd love to hear more about your suggestions or ideas or about how to engage and have bigger impact. And, you know, we're in this cascading crises and disruptions of all kinds. And it seems a lot of times that mainstream economics is just, you know, taking us down the wrong path in so many directions. So um, do you have ideas more about how to expand, elevate, have bigger impact policy-wise, and how to kind of resist many of the mainstream narratives um, that are causing so much damage? Thank you. Well, it's a, an excellent question, but a difficult one. <laughs> uh, well, you would hope that uh, organizations like the FMM can uh, help to have some impact. Uh, you know, in the States, you had the Levy Institute. Um, MMT has demonstrated that, that being highly visible on social media is one way to attract attention. Um, if, if many, I mean, if many of you can go beyond academia and get into international organizations, or if you can work, I don't know, in the Department of Finance, in a government or something like this, if you, one of you can become a deputy governor of the, some central bank, uh, then certainly <laughs> you will have more influence than uh, myself writing a paper in a journal. You know? <laughs> so yeah, that's all I can say about this. Um, again, there are some among us who are more involved into policy than I am. I am more into theory, but uh, so one, one cannot do everything, you know, but uh, that's why some of us are less trained into the minute details of theory, but they are good at advocating policy or at being visible uh, on social media. Hi, hello. Thank you very much, Mark, for your presentation. Uh, I'm Daniel Spinola from Birmingham City University in the UK. And my question is regarding your mention about developing countries, because 
We see that the post-Keynesian economics was very successful in developing itself in South America and Latin America. But other parts of the world, such as Africa, Central Asia, it's quite incipient. And uh, thinking about how we can bring those ideas that are quite relevant for development to these areas, do you have any thoughts, any ideas and suggestions on how we as a community could actually get closer to these areas and develop ourselves? Uh, yeah, thank you. Right, good question. For first, I should say that uh, South Korea has... Uh, has experimented with, with the so-called wage-led policies. They called it income-led policies. So we did have a, an impact, at least in one country. <laughs> um, and then with regard to the second part of the question, uh, you know, when I go to Argentina or Brazil, oftentimes I'm being asked, oh, well, what, is, what are your recommendations with regards to uh, what we should be doing and all this? And my feeling is that, again, I'm a, more of a theoretician. I can bring you all these ideas that we have in post keynesian economics, but you guys from Argentina or, or Brazil or from Africa, uh, you are the ones who know your country best. So you are the ones who know whether these ideas can apply to uh, your country or not. So in a sense, <laughs> you know, to speak about something fashionable, I would say, well, I don't want to impose the white privilege on, uh, <laughs> you know, people from the South. I mean, they, they are the ones who have the uh, knowledge about this. So the, the good thing that I am bringing is perhaps new ideas, and they can discover whether these ideas apply or not to their country. So I, 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 was, already, I was always on, on, on of this opinion 20 years ago. You know, I, I was giving the same advice 20 years ago. It's not because of all of what is being discussed now uh, that I <laughs> take this view. <laughs> uh, hi there, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Uh, I'm a PhD student from Newcastle University, UK. Uh, I have a, a question regarding, uh, what are your views on current monetary policy tightening in the advance? Sorry, on uh, monetary policy, policy tight tightening. Okay, yeah, yeah. so the uh, inverse QE. Yeah, so uh, in current inflationary pressures. And would this lead to 1980s cascade of debt crisis in the global south? Uh -huh. uh, well, what might lead to a crisis in the global south is if interest rates uh, rise very quickly. So this, you know, destroys the, what was the typical hierarchy over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. Uh, about uh, about monetary policy tightening in the sense of uh, reverse quantity easing. I, I think it should, I mean, if people know that it will happen, it shouldn't have much of an impact because what is the impact of QE, quantitative easing? It's, in my mind, it is simply that it tries to lower long-term rates of interest relative to the short-term rates of interest. So if you, if you reverse QE, then, uh, well, the only thing that would happen is perhaps an increase in the spreads between short-term rates and long-term rates. I don't think it should have any other impact. I mean, that's my view on it. Yeah. Hi, I'm Simon Furs from the Javier Berlin. Um, so basically, I had a question. So obviously, uh, Keynes himself was kind of basing himself on the neoclassical theories, and it was a big part, the kind of neoclassical theories of the way he presented things in uh, the general theory. And some people are making the critique that still to this day, heterodox economics and like Polk's Keynesianism specifically is still kind of based on neoclassical theory. For example, like Sheik saying particularly to do with the theories of competition. I just wanted to ask you, do you think that critique is fair? And if so, does that matter at all, basically? Okay, well on this I would say, and, and along with a few others, uh, that uh, Kalitsky is the best uh, person to follow. 
So uh, this was the view also of, of Joan Robinson. Well, okay, let me put it this way. They are both, they both have very interesting ideas, but from a different angle. One could say that, well, Kialetsky is more interesting from the real side, but on the other hand, as was shown by the global financial crisis, the ideas of Keynes are more interesting on the monetary side or and the financial side. So, I mean, my view is uh, everyone, every theory has some weaknesses, every school of thought has some weaknesses. So what you should do is take the best of Keynes and take the best of Kalecki. Kalecki also had a few things to say about uh, interest rates and monetary policy. And in fact, uh, Jan uh, Toporowski has just written a book on the monetary economics of, uh, and of Kalecki. I wonder how he managed to write a whole book on it when Kalecki has just written a few lines, but... <laughs> Hi, again, thank you very much. I'm from National Autonomous University of Mexico. Well, I'm not going to ask about developing economies <laughs> again. Um, my ask is a more theoretical one. Um, how do you define the current orthodoxy? I mean, there's clearly a huge lack because we have a, this uh, speak about inclusive topics like gender and all this important stuff right now. But I feel, as a student, that there's, the, there's like no future in this sense. Like we don't know the, where the economy goes, and in your opinion, what's the future? If it's post-clinician, could be awesome, but I don't know. How do you feel about it? Well, uh, if I am a true post-Kindian believing in uncertainty, then I just don't know what the future <laughs> will be. <laughs> you know, I mean, take the, the, the case of inflation. You know, we, were, we had kind of totally forgotten about it, and then suddenly there we go. The rate of inflation uh, in many countries is around 8%. What do we do about it? Uh, so, you know, who would have predicted that there would be a, a war, uh, that Russia would be attacking Ukraine, and that there would be many consequences? So, uh, you know, people ask me, uh, what, is, what are your future research plans? And my answer is usually I don't have any. I just, uh, <laughs> I just go, as, uh, I go as, as it goes, you know. It's a, so, I mean, my, my advice would be to work on what you are interested about. Uh, maybe it's not fashionable today, but it may be in the future. Uh, my, my, I have a friend, Jonathan Marie, who was sharing my office at the University of Paris 13 uh, for three years. And uh, he's a specialist, he works on inflation. And he was being asked by his colleagues, why do you work on inflation? Don't, you should be working on things more interesting, important, like unemployment, you know, or the ecology. And, uh, but now he, <laughs> he, he's right in it. I mean, I, I saw his CV recently. And he's been to 10 or 15 interviews on television and the radio <laughs> because he's the only one who's writing, has been writing about inflation for the last 10 years. So just do what you're interested in. I mean, that's my advice. Plus a bit of econometrics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a wise idea. Uh, my name is Ula Schenner. Uh, Mark, I have a question. You placed MMT in the post-Keynesian framework, and you also said that some strands, of course, get more attention, and uh, not only by US Congress. But what I observe is that our mainstream colleagues, and also some of our post keynesian colleagues like Tom Paylor, have a very direct attack on MMT. And I think this is quite interesting. And since the title of your, the book is In Defense of post keynesian and Heterodox Economists, and I know also the problems with MMT, but how would you react to this very, because in some way, I think it's opening uh, new 
lines of interest, as you said, students are getting interested. My students also came up with a similar question. So how would you respond to this? Because it's really uh, interesting. Eh? They are not, they don't, they are quite restraining from uh, themselves to attack post-Keynesian. I think because on the theoretical side, they are not up to, but they choose MMT as a target. So that would be, right? thanks. Yeah, well, uh, Joël Leclerc, who is sitting just beside you right there, is going to talk about it. And there will be someone in the same session who takes a, a more critical view. Uh, Joe Mitchell will perhaps answer some, uh, some of your questions. Uh, all I can say is that I agree with most of what M MMT people are saying. Uh, but, you know, we are scholars and uh, we don't agree on everything. You know, like uh, Eckhart Hein has a certain view of inflation which is slightly different from the one that I advocate. Uh, so it's the same in neoclassical econo economics. Everybody, they don't all agree on the same model or the same view. And so, again, my answer is, well, take what you think is good in MMT, and if there are some features that you don't like, well, you just reject them and, and put them aside. Uh, <laughs> so, it's what is true for other, uh, other theories is true as well for MMT. Yeah. Sorry, maybe my answer is not very convincing. <laughs> I, what, what I should say, is, so of course you've got post-Keynesians like uh, Tom Pally who, who think that uh, MMT is claiming too much. Uh, and he believes that it hurts heterodox economics because then uh, the, if you want the simple view, the s simplified view of MMT gives a false impression of what uh, we are doing. So, but you've got to read the more complex explanations uh, of that, you know, the, the books that have been, or the articles that have been written, rather than the blogs. Yeah. Hello, um, I'm also from the Bolin School of Economics and I just started my graduating um, courses um, and I'm just starting to learn about post keynesian economics. So I'm interested in what would you say is the largest weak spot of post keynesian economics? The largest what? Weak spot. So what criticism of the mainstreamers would you acknowledge the most that you heard in the course of the last years? So are you asking about the weaknesses of yeah. post keynesian economics? Yeah. <laughs> or the one that maybe is the most persistent one that you would say, okay, we find, have to find answers. <laughs> well, I, I never thought in those terms. <laughs> no, I, I, I think if a neoclassical, well, first, a neoclassical economist looking at the post keynesian models, uh, they are distressed. They don't understand. I mean, to them, it seems highly complicated. I mean, you know, I discussed this with my colleagues at the University of Ottawa. I mean, oh, your book is really complicated. It's not, you know, it's very simple formalization, but because the assumptions are different, then f for them it's very difficult to understand. And I think, you know, th th this is the, the problem with specialization. Every, we all get specialized. Like for me, reading some works by Marxists, I also find that very difficult. Uh, you know, because they, they use some vocabulary which is different from mine. And so, yeah, I think the, the, the most critique that the, the, a neoclassical would make of post Keynesian economics would be that, well, you guys do not assume uh, utility maximization, you guys do not assume profit maximization, you guys are not using Lagrangians, you know, so. This would be the, the 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 critique I think they would come up with. Uh, yeah. 
Yes, so sorry, we have to stop here because there's some uh, lunch outside. <laughs> Thank you for all your questions. <laughs>